This lightning talk is going to be about playing dots and boxes, a two-player game using endgame theory and a special case of endgame values. Dots and boxes is a two-player game. The two players are taking turns drawing lines, and you score by completing four sides of a box. And if you score, you take another turn, and the winner is whoever takes the most num uh, number of boxes. Um, so in the end game, a common situation that happens is you have two boxes situated like that where B is a non-capture move. The next player to move, which we call left, could play either A or B. Um, and if he plays A followed by B, scores two boxes, he's forced to play first on the remainder of the board. If he plays B, then right, then the second player to play can play A, scores two boxes, and plays on the first plays first on the remainder of the board. In effect, left can determine who plays first on the rest of the board, and at least one of those has to be a winning move, which takes the majority of the boxes. So having a position that looks like that is favorable if you're the next player to move. Keep that in mind. Now, because a handout is such a favorable position, we don't want to give a position like that. A move that sacrifices a handout, we call that a loony move. And um, positions in which all moves are loony come up a lot in the end game because nobody wants to play here. We call that a loony position. Um, and combinations of those are what are of interest in dots and boxes. Now, a special case of a loony move is if you have a capture string which allows you to capture um, some number of boxes and lead up to a loony position. So um, you could take. You could definitely take three boxes. Whether or not you want to take the last two um, is the interesting part, right? Now, uh, uh, two special cases of loony positions are the chain and the loop. And if the if a long chain has more than if you have a long chain of more than three uh, three or more boxes actually is broken, you're always going to have a loony. Uh, you're always going to give a handout, and the opponent can take all but two or can take all, right? With a loop, if it's broken, the opponent can take all the boxes, or he can take all but two and leave you with four boxes and force you to play first in the remainder of the position. Uh, these two positions have very interesting endgame properties. Now, in the endgame position, what's really interesting is the value, right? How many boxes can uh, do we have to sacrifice here on it, right? Um, if you have two short chains of one box each, uh, it turns out both sides are going to take one, right? Left is going to sacrifice one box, right takes it, and then back and back to left. And it turns out they cancel each other out in terms of value. If you have two short chains and they are uh, two, uh, one and two boxes, they could differ by at most a value of one. And similarly, having a box of one and two uh, gives... Uh, can, can change the value by at most one. And if you have long chains and long loops, uh, the difference in value is at most the difference in the chain or the loop. This is in a previous work, actually. I, I, I mostly just use this uh, result. Now, if you have two long chains or two long loops, it turns out you can combine them. And uh, now this is where I my work begins. It turns out that other positions can be broken down into uh, chains and or loops. So it turns out if you have a T formation, uh, they, it becomes a, 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 a number of chains, and then you can possibly amalgamate them depending on the sizes of the chains. Uh, similarly, for multi-legged spiders, they tend to break down to chains because you'll generally break the shortest chain first and then so on. Once you do that, the long chains can then be amalgamated in most cases. Uh, also of interest is once we do have a series of long chains and loops or other loony uh, endgames, what's the value of the endgame? In general, this is an MP-complete problem to compute, but we can generally approximate it to where the, even the bound itself is pretty useful. It turns out that a greedy strategy in which right always maintains control, which means sacrificing two boxes every time a chain is given, four boxes every loop, and then you have to bound how many chains and loops are actually given and taken, right? And it turns out this is tight enough for us to get a result most of the time. 
So putting it all together, what does that allow us to do? Well, we have a position, G, which might have a lot of endgame components, and G prime are the things that are not endgame components. We could have up to one chain of size one, right? Because if we have two, it cancels out, right? We could have up to two, uh, up to one ch uh, chain of size two. We could have any number of chains of size three, actually, because they don't amalgamate, right? That's that's the only uh, only chain that could potentially be unlimited. We can only have at most one chain of four or more because if we have more than one they amalgamate similarly for the loops uh for the handouts you could have a handout of four or a handout of two depending on um, uh if you broke a chain or a loop now what what does a legal move on g consist of now well if a handout is already given we got to give or take it right we can take all the boxes or we could give the boxes to the opponent. If not, what are the, the possible, uh, well, possible optimal moves we can make? Obviously, a move on G prime because we don't know much about it. We could break the shortest short chain, right? There's no reason to break a chain of size two if there's a size uh, chain of size one. We could break the sh uh, shortest long chain, right? If there's a chain of three, we always break that one first, or we could break the shortest loop. Now, what about end game tables? If we have components that are small enough, right? For example, if your component fits, uh, a component is a contiguous set of empty lines. If they fit in this area up to 30 spaces, 2 to the power of 30, that's about a billion different endgames we have. How do we give a value to that? Well, we approximate uh, dots and boxes by creating a, uh, another game called NimString, where the goal is to be the player to make the last move, basically to regain control, right? Um, and the end game value can then be computed. This is a, 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 an example of a nimber in combinatorial games. And it can serve as an approximation to the result of dots and boxes. Now using both of these results, what do we do? Well, we can test uh, the Monte Carlo tree search, the plain, manila, uh, plain vanilla flavor of Monte Carlo, Carlo tree search against we could do a Monte Carlo tree search on the factored positions with the end games factored out and on the pos uh, factored positions with the end game values for an M string. And we find that we improve a lot with the factored positions. And then we improve somewhat more with the implicit positions with the uh, NIM string values. Uh, the catch is that we're only improving a little bit, but the end game tables take up 10 gigabytes. So uh, I wonder if we can compress that data. Uh, I, I didn't get to it before this talk. I hope to work on that next. And um, the other thing that's really disappointing is that there are a lot of loony positions that are not covered in the factored positions because generally what happens is they, they have a loop in them and then uh, the, uh, a chain out of it. That doesn't really convert to a, a chain or a loop very easily because you're forcing the player to break the chain before the loop, which generally does not happen, right? Anyways, uh, thank you for your attention.